Gentlemen of our most prestigious court of Athens, may I praise your patience and diligence in the presentation of the prosecution. I, Miletus, stand before you unequivocally convinced that the criminal is guilty as charged. The hideous snub-nosed Socrates is charged with corrupting the young men of Athens with his rhetoric and poisonous oratory skill an undeniable fact. Socrates also stands before you charged with denying the gods their authority and challenging the beliefs of every genuine Athenian. He insults our great city with his relentless, irritating presence, a fly in great need of a spider. He shows no signs of remorse for his conduct or apology for his crimes, a true reflection of his guilt. I beg you, loyal judicators of Athens, listen to his words, hear him twist them to his own malevolent purpose. Look into his eyes, see his lack of contrition. He says he knows nothing. I know at least one thing. The evidence presented by the prosecution proves Socrates is guilty, and he should accept the judgment of the Athenian court. Gentlemen, I rest my case. Hello and welcome to episode 71 of the Man's Eye. <laughs> I'm the unapologetic Jack Sines, and I'm joined once again by the man on a mission from God, Mr. Andrew Horton. Hello! And the horse corrupting Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello! Ho, ho, ho! It's getting close to Christmas. <laughs> Any plans for the festive season, gentlemen? It's about two or three days away. Are those festive beards? Are they just in the spirit of Socrates? I'm looking forward to spending time with my family. Um, I hope there's some snow, because there's never snow, but if there is, I'm really forward to playing in the snow. Um, and yeah, just it's a time to eat, drink, and be merry. Mm. Unlike Socrates. <laughs> Andrew, I look you? forward to eating my vegan Christmas dinner while annoying my family as I do so. <laughs> <laughs> the last couple of years we've said uh, like we've advertised it as a, a pan cast christmas special uh, i remember one year my, we always what, do nietzsche don't we at christmas yeah, we always do nietzsche There's so we've got socrates this a little bit more depressing that's way time. better <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're looking at the athenian nietzsche <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I remember one student coming to me after they saw online that I'd said, like, we're doing a Christmas special. I think it was the one me and you did with Mark Lintz and Mara Ollie okay. and oh, yeah, Greg yeah, Sadler. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and Greg Sadler's got some brilliant um, episodes on, on his YouTube channel, we might yeah. say, for Place as well, worth a little plug there. One of my students was like, that wasn't Christmassy at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it didn't actually include anything to do with Christmas. This one's going to be no different. <laughs> <laughs> we make no apologies oh yeah i'm not going to apologize for the lack of christmas cheer it's getting uh, yeah it's getting pretty close to it i think two three days close to christmas i know we said no presents this year didn't we we did say no presents uh did we i don't think we made that that argument at all but I now thought, you're going to upstage us no with <laughs> on stage <laughs> some That's sort of <laughs> just so everyone knows i didn't bring any presents that's fine i thought no presents actually oh, meant. Oh, Jack, you oh, should Christmas. have. Wow. Look at this. I it's like it's the your pan psychast Christmas. Look at this. <laughs> Thank you. I'd now, like to say uh, I wrapped that myself, but I did have some help. Now, was this some sort of book you've bought us, Jack? So, it, yeah, they're just, I like these little. Like an introduction. You're welcome to, to crack them open. Can you, can it is Christmas in two days. We'll open, it, we'll open them a little bit early. Very colourful wrapping paper, yeah. Jack. Thank you. Thank you. They're, they're, they are nice, aren't they? Very This is a very short introduction to something. I like these little small editions. So What's I thought that? you might what might enjoy Ooh, these I gifts. Like okay, I'll go first. I've got Plato's The Symposium. Mm, Very you said nice. you wanted to read some more Plato last episode. I so did. I thought... And you really took me on my word. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> that Damn. time of year, whatever you say, you could have been like, <laughs> no, no, I, no. I wish I had an afro and I would have brought you, <laughs> I would have brought you no, one. Jack, this is lovely. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Merry Christmas. Thank you. And I've got here... Uh, what is Enlightenment by Immanuel Kant? <laughs> the essay that I believe he came second in. Behind. Uh, uh, it was, uh, which the Jewish only Jewish philosophy. scholar I'm well read on. <laughs> My Maimonides. No, uh, no Mendel Moses Mendelssohn. It's, Men it's Mendelssohn, isn't it? Yeah, Maimonides yeah. are way older. <laughs> yeah, he was that, his essay was that bad. He lost by like 800 years. <laughs> 500, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Thank you. I've, I was worried you might have it already. That's well, Andy does no, have I, the tattoo of it. So now it's just very awkward. Uh, guys, do I have a... So when we said no, gifts we actually meant no gifts it's what you both are i mean <laughs> yeah I mean, this illusion we're keeping up that it is actually christmas no well, two days prior it's not actually yeah. christmas you're exactly come on right. ollie don't you don't 
<laughs> don't make people think we're like we're recording this at the end of August. <laughs> that, that is obscene. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack, but we'll get you one for next episode, which won't be the next episode. It'll be like probably the one. <laughs> You're a mess. The very. A very special thank you to Cullen St. Gabriel's and Westland Dammon and all of our patrons for supporting the show. In particular, thank you to David Legionnaire, Dylan Kirby, Lily, Lily Hooper, Jim Clare and Mr. T. Ollie, you have a very special ma- message for David, Dylan, Mr. T, Lily and Jim. It can't be one of them. They're like plugs. <laughs> that, yeah. you, need to, you need to thank them in the Christmas spirit. Well, to all of you, our very fond patrons, Merry Christmas. Uh, Whether you are spending it with your family, with your friends, or with us when you're listening to the podcast, um, know that we love you very much. We appreciate your very kind donation. Um, And it just is the definition of the Christmas spirit, isn't it? Just giving to a good cause. And you know that we're going to use your money and use it in a really productive uh, way um, to help the podcast, you know, and make the quality of it really good so we can reach even more people. So you get the best quality content and everyone's reading philosophy, listening to philosophy, happy, cheery. It's just wonderful. So thank you. Well, we'll make this a bit of a Christmas plug because we we, we gloss over it sometimes, don't we? But some of the changes you would have seen in the last few years, if you go back to our first episode to now, you can see the microphones, the equipment that we're using, the studio that we're in. All of this is funded by you. Like It goes directly back into supporting the show for you, every penny which comes through Patreon. So we massively appreciate it. If you want the show to get better, if you want extra content, if you want to get access to the after shows that we record, if you want pre-releases to every single episode, we try and put just put as much as we can out there on patreon and in the new year one of my new year's resolutions will be to keep putting the exact same amount of stuff on there so how's that uh andrew you're looking at me with quote eyes no <laughs> just not happy you, just happy it's christmas i'm just yeah it's nice you know like sat around family drinking eggnog me with my hemlock <laughs> uh, just just enough to put me on the edge of death well jack <laughs> jack's put the seed in your head you're like oh wow it has been a while since i've listened to that first episode of the pan so i wonder if i'll go back and don't, don't go back and listen to it. Um, just listen to our more recent episodes because they're way better. Listen to this one right here. Let, let's, let's do it. Let's do this episode right now. Let's uh, have one listener question for this episode, as promised. Cue our wonderful listener questions jingle. Hello? We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Hello? Is there somebody there? Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. But Greg might be there. But Greg might be there as well. Hello? Some pe- people complain that that jingle isn't the best. <laughs> people <laughs> complained a long time ago that it's not the best. But it's still. Well, I've but- only seen one thing on Twitter where it was yeah. like, never do that again. I've had a. Two emails in the last year, this year, saying that people don't like the music for the introduction and the section jingles. Oh, really? And I thought that they meant the old ones, the ukulele. Uh, but no, they don't like the current one. And oh. one listener who will remain anonymous, because uh, I can't remember the name, and I would name and shame you if I could remember <laughs> it, um, is something like, um, I really like the podcast, but I don't like the childish jingles. And therefore, I won't be recommending it to my friends, basically, oh. unless you change it. Um, well we won't (laughs) (laughs) yeah so thank you thank you for (laughs) for like it's a it's a real half and half well Um, i guess we should probably make it less fun i guess also if the jingles are the most childish thing that you've picked up on (laughs) you've not listened to enough (laughs) (laughs) here's a listener question from kirsten sheed and Kirsten asks, Hi, I have a question. I'm listening to the series on Machiavelli. Early on, you were talking about his advocating for a standing army rather than mercenaries. Living in the US with its weird ways of selling military service and beer, I'm wondering about the uses of patriotism and what patriotism might actually be. Is patriotism separate from love of country? What do we think? Ooh, interesting. Ooh, thank you very much for that. Lovely question, Kirsten. It's a really interesting question. I really like this question, actually. Questions about, like, what patriotism is and, like, you know, when people say, like, oh, I'm really proud to be British or I'm really proud to be an American and stuff. Like, what does that actually mean? Right. Does that mean that you're proud of things that you haven't done or you're proud of, like, the connotations of what it is to be from a certain place? Um, In terms of what actual definition of patriotism is, I do believe it's pride of a country. Uh, Quote, uh, you might be able to correct me on that, Mr. Horton. 
Well, I mean, in essence, yes, but it comes from the same root word as like like patriarch, right? It's like the idea of like, there is like the father. You might hear like the motherland or the fatherland, mm. or like it, it really taps into a kind of a thing that I guess a lot of countries and and this is across cultures and time, right, where people really believe that they've kind of been born out of this country and therefore they have a duty to it. And I think patriotism appeals to that, right? Like. Like I am a like a, a son or a daughter of the country, and therefore I must do uh, do what is necessary to keep this country great and prosperous. And in ways that's fine, but I think you can like love or respect your country without that kind of deeper sense that some people appeal to. Without getting to political philosophy, because we did that in in the Machiavelli episode itself, I think that we've got to be very careful with things like nationalism. Because if you look at like the the twentieth century. You know, a lot of the wars fought, especially the world wars, were mainly based on, you know, Nash nations fighting over nationalistic empire and all that sort of stuff. So I feel like that's if you take it to the extreme, obviously, it can be quite dangerous. But I think that there's nothing wrong with people being proud of where they're from and and, uh, you know, being kind of content with their lot and their family and their. I don't really understand me being proud of land per se, but I don't know if you really like the land that you are surrounded by, whether it's like a, mm. a certain type of environment. then yeah, sure. Quick rant. Um, are you proud? You can say yes, no, or not answering. Are you proud to be an Englishman, Ollie? Yes, no, not answering. Uh, In a well, word. I think is I'm half English, half Australian. Oh, are you proud to be Australian? So, I mean, sure. It's cool. Are you proud to be English? Um, but for, with, it's just weird, though. So for me, like... Just pri- looking for a word answer. Go on. <laughs> for me, pride entails having some form of, like, involvement in something, right? So, like, I create, a, like a like, a painting, and I'm proud of it but I haven't really like created England or Australia. So like, yeah, it's cool. You add to its many virtues. Proud of it, I guess. Not in the same way. You're like Socrates in Athens. You you add to the fabric of the society, whether they know it or not. I think some people, when they say they're proud proud of something, they feel like ownership of it. And I don't feel ownership of the UK or Australia. So take me out what you want. Just being like pedantic about it i just wouldn't i just wouldn't use the word pride right i i'm i feel like i'm very fortunate to to be an englishman as you've said or like or being british and in which case yeah i'm like i'm i'm very happy that i live in a country where there is a lot of freedom and i don't have to kind of be afraid that the government are going to lock put, me up put me on trial like, in front of 500 people yeah. and me to death. <laughs> yeah. am i right like i'm allowed to, segue <laughs> i'm allowed to not believe in the gods and <laughs> that's <the> okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I'm, I'm gonna continue ripping on zeus and it's all good yeah in which case like i think when a lot of people say they're like they're proud to be british a lot of the reasons why they say that i probably would agree i just wouldn't use that word pride because i don't like a lot of the connotations it also adds to it I feel you. And and thank you, Kirsten, for your question. Do submit questions through our website. We should say this is one in four episodes. We're doing 70 on Euthyphro, 71 on Apology, 72 on Crito, 73 on Fido, which is, yeah, it's bang on. It's correct. So I'm questioning myself there in true Socratic fashion. And yeah, so this is well worth going back and listening to our previous episode on Euthyphro. This installment today, we're going to be jumping into a reading of Plato's Apology, which sees Socrates in court defending himself against the charges as laid out in the last dialogue. And yeah, in the second section, we're going to be engaging in some further analysis and discussion. Almost normal. That was almost normal. (laughs) Okay, in the next section, we'll be engaging in some further analysis and discussion. Part one, apology. So like we did with Euthyphro, we'll talk a little bit about the context of here, a little bit of background for the text. And we find Socrates in court, don't we? It's a democracy. We've got like 500 or 501 members of the public who form the jury in this trial. Indeed. So chronologically, this is after Euthyphro. So we've had Socrates outside the courtroom having a little bit of a chat with our dear friend Euthyphro. Um, and then obviously he walks off and walks into uh, walks into court where he is on trial. He is being prosecuted by a man named Miletus, who he briefly mentions in Euphorfro. I think like once we mentioned him, mm. we didn't really say who he was. So Miletus is the man who is prosecuting Socrates in court. So as we begin the story of the apology or begin the dialogue or more of a monologue, which it is, 
Miletus has just finished his prosecution and then Socrates is defending himself. Now, the actual dialogue itself is called the Apology. Now, to our modern ears, that may seem like, oh, he's saying sorry for something. He must have made some kind of mistake. But in the kind of context of the dialogue itself, Apology doesn't mean saying sorry. It's more his defence. He's defending his view. He's not necessarily apologising from it. I do believe I have the phrase here, if I can read it, which is Apologia pro vita sura, which is justification for his life. Oh, cool. So there you go, a little bit of Greek for you there, probably. This is often considered to be like one of the, the best accounts of the historical Socrates, given the huge audience of about 500 people. We've also got Xenophon's uh, The Apology of Socrates to the Jury, which has lots of similarities between the two. We won't go into the, the differences here, but there's plenty of sources. And I think both, obviously both are freely available online if you wanted to compare and contrast and look at them both side by side. He's obviously still portrayed in a really nice way by Plato, though, isn't he? Plato is a huge fan, and yeah. he's, he, there's a bit of bias here still. Yeah, it's heavily implied that Plato is in the courtroom, uh, maybe f furiously scribbling down the pages and pages of stuff that Socrates is saying. This is actually contradicted later in the Phaedo, where it says that he's not there. So mm. I guess that, yes, we can say this is the best representation of the historical Socrates, but with a big asterisk saying but there are still embellishments. And again, like we said at the beginning of the previous episode, uh, Plato is presenting Socrates how he thinks Socrates deserves to be presented. Um, spoiler alert, this trial doesn't really go great for Socrates, and a lot of people were really not happy about him. So therefore, I think Plato is very keen to make sure that the what he believed to be the true, genuine Socrates is well presented. So he gets a lot of time to present his views, present his arguments, um, and you really get to feel what the what it would have been like to talk to the the actual, real historical Socrates. So Andy, what is Socrates being accused of? So if if you have listened to the previous one on Euphro, if you've read Euphro before, then you'll know that he he talks uh, to Euphro about his the accusations being made that is he's going against the Athenian gods. He's being accused of well weirdly contradictory things, either that he doesn't believe in the gods or he's making up new gods, um, and he's also being accused of corrupting the youth uh, and and kind of getting people to question the uh, like Athenian law. Um, all things which are highly questionable. So he tries to, I suppose, defend his case in a particularly uh, interesting fashion. Um, there's no point in explaining all of that now because we'll, of course, get into it as we read the dialogues. We, we also see that these are very well tied together, as we'll look at in our next installment further analysis. But the only difference in terms of the charges that we have in Apology from Euthyphro is there seems to be a third charge. So look out for this in the text. Uh, quote, Socrates is committing an injustice in that he inquires into things below the earth and in the sky and makes weaker arguments to defeat the stronger and teaches others to follow his example. Um, so this is often considered as he's like doing science as well. So there's a real mix of exactly what it is that we're not exactly sure. And like Ollie said, this probably comes, this uh, apology from Socrates, what we're about to read is probably one of many arguments the court would have heard from both sides. So this is one snippet. This isn't the exhaustive account. With that said, Ollie, this is neither the exhaustive account from Socrates, is it? <laughs> um, which is not really a dialogue in the original text. Yeah, so remember we said in the previous episode the Apology is most likely Plato's first text. And like anybody's first text, it's it's probably not what he would later become. So a lot of his later Platonic dialogues are dialogues. They're different characters talking to each other. Uh, the Apology isn't really. Most of it is just Socrates talking to the court. So what I've tried to do with this one when I kind of was thinking about how we're going to present this is I've taken a lot of the, the questions that Socrates asks himself and then answers himself. And I've given that to the judiciary and I've given that to Miletus. So obviously we've got the character of Miletus, who is uh, the prosecution, who's charging Socrates with corrupting the youth and either worshipping the wrong gods or not believing in gods, depending on which passage it is. Um, and I've given the judiciary a kind of character as well. So Socrates is going to be kind of talking to the judiciary and they're going to be talking back. Objection. This isn't staying true to the original text. Of course it's not. <laughs> I'm not Plato. We're not Socrates. Like we're, we're embellishing it a bit to make it a bit more entertaining to listen to. If you want to go and read the apology, go and read it. It's out there. This is our interpretation of it to make it a bit more dramatic and a bit more kind of fun. Um, and it's, it's philosophy. <laughs> Philosophy with a Overruled. <laughs> oh, God. This is going to be terrible. Uh, <laughs> philosophy with a smile, right? Like we, we want to make this a bit fun. It is a courtroom drama. I don't know about you guys. I love a courtroom drama. So I've tried to make it a little bit more like that, and hopefully it will work. And we'll see. You can be the judge of that at you the end of the episode. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I should have added that. Uh, if you can think of a good time to add that, please do. <laughs> we will. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'll be saying that every other <laughs> line. 
<laughs> is it right that you think this, this, and this? You can't handle the truth, Socrates. But indeed. <laughs> Without further ado, let's jump into the pan cast reading of Plato's Apology. Order in the court, order. Thank you for Miletus, for the prosecution. Socrates, you may begin your defence. I do not know, men of Athens, how the prosecution affected you. I was nearly convinced by their arguments. Apart from the fact that hardly any of it was true. Oh, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> I am not an accomplished speaker. Unless indeed they call me an accomplished speaker, the man who speaks the truth. From me you will hear the whole truth. Though not by Zeus, gentlemen, expressed in stylized phrases like theirs. But things expressed in the first words that come to mind. For I put my trust in the justice of what I say, and let none of you expect anything else. This is my first appearance in a law court at the age of 70. I am therefore simply a stranger to the manner of speaking here. My gift to you is for you to pay attention to my manner of speech. Be it better or worse to concentrate your attention on whether what I say is just or not. For the excellence of a judge lies in this, as that of a speaker lies in telling the truth. Ooh, NC. We'll end that one nice and early there. Uh, So we're going to be quite brief with the breakdowns. We find Socrates in court and immediately um, he's told he can't handle the truth by muttering people in the crowds. (laughs) And and secondly, he's saying, right, I'm not very accustomed to being in the courtroom here. I'm probably going to slip into my normal dialectic fashion. Uh, And he knows from the offset that they're probably not going to like this. They want to be addressed in a certain way. Um, He's standing in front of 500 members of the city, some of the most powerful people there as well. Uh, He's he's. I guess, playing it quite risky from the offset. Yeah, and uh, this is something that kind of goes throughout the the entire rest of the actual book, right? Which is that Socrates is not going to tell them what they want to hear. And there's like a certain way of going about it, which is actually quite likely to to get him off the hook. But he's unprepared to do so. So he's just going to see where his way of doing things goes regardless. Should we let's jump right back into it then. So we find ourselves Socrates entering into his normal dialectic fashion here. It is right for me, gentlemen, to defend myself first against the lying accusations made against me and my first accusers, and then against the later accusations. There have been many for many years who have accused me to you, and none of their accusations are true. The accusers got hold of most of you from childhood, persuaded you, and accused me quite falsely, saying that there is a man called Socrates, a wise man, a student of all things in the sky and below the earth who makes the worst arguments the stronger. Moreover, these accusers are numerous, don't believe in the gods, and have been at it for a long time. They spoke to you at an age when you would most readily believe them, some of you being children, and they won their case by default, as there was no defence. Very well then. I must surely defend myself, and attempt to uproot from your minds in so short a time the slander that has resided there so long. What is the accusation from which arose the slander in which Miletus trusted when he wrote out the charge against me? What did they say when they slandered me? Socrates is guilty of wrongdoing in that he busies himself studying things in the sky and below the earth. He makes the worse into the stronger argument and he teaches these same things to others. You have seen this yourselves in the comedy of Aristophanes, a Socrates swinging about there, saying he was walking on air and talking a lot of other nonsense about things of which I know nothing at all. I do not speak in contempt of such knowledge. If someone is wise in these things, then Miletus, please bring more cases against me. But gentlemen, I have no part in it. I call upon the majority of you as witnesses. Uh, Yeah, we'll see that. Not one of them is true. And if you have heard from anyone that I undertake to teach people and charge a fee for it, that is not true either. Indeed, I met a man who has spent more money on sophists than everybody else put together. Callias, the son of Hipponicus. So I asked him, Callias, I said, if your two sons were calves, we would find a supervisor for them who would make them excel in their proper qualities, some horse breeder or farmer. Now, since they are men, whom do you have in mind to supervise them? Who is an expert in this kind of excellence? The human and social kind? Is there such a person, I asked? Or is there not? Certainly there is such a person. That's what Callias said. Who is he? What is his name? Where is he from? And what is his fee? 
His name, Socrates, is Evanus. He comes from Paris, and his fee is five minas. I thought Evanus a happy man. If he really possesses this art and teaches for so moderate a fee, certainly I would pride myself if I had this knowledge. But I do not have it, gentlemen. Awesome. Okay, so in this scene here, we've got Socrates confronting what we call his old accusers. He's gained this reputation for corrupting the youth, for being a fool amongst society. And we have this reference to Aristophanes' famous play, The Clouds, which is essentially mocking Socrates as a kind of a sophist, a teacher of um, corrupt rhetoric, which makes your arguments fancy. And it's definitely worth reading The Clouds if you're unfamiliar with it. We've got Socrates essentially being a buffoon. And Aristophanes is one of the most famous playwrights. Everyone's going to see his plays. Everyone knows what they are. And he thinks that he's pointing the finger here to saying, look, this is the reason why I'm here. Here's like a, an explanation for why I've gained this reputation. Uh, the plays by Aristophanes as well are not like highbrow theatre. Um, a lot of the presentation of Socrates in this plays is just, like really weird old fashioned sex jokes and like toilet yeah. humour. He's not presented as being like this lofty intellectual philosopher. He's literally presented as being like, a joke yeah um and that's a lot of the well a lot of the people in the judiciary would probably have had that opinion of him although um, it is interesting because uh i haven't read the entire thing but i i, I listened to maybe the first i don't know like hour of uh, socrates and love which mm. is basically just a, a biography of socrates and it talks about the play um and it gives the defense of aristophanes in that uh, it seems to be anyway that he wanted to make that play in a particular way he actually accused people of not understanding the subtlety of the mm. satire so maybe maybe to give him some credit is that like he was doing it in a particular way and people actually just misunderstood it for being this kind of it'd be like watching south park and yeah. then like thinking it was all just jokes about like crude humor whereas actually there was like a underlying social theme or something i think i'd agree as well because socrates and aristophanes were definitely friends and the style of aristophanes's plays there were comedies they were satirical and they'd all wear the you know those classic masks when they're doing the performances mm. and performers during the intervals would rip off their masks run out to people in the crowd and like be like oh you're an idiot farmer and blah 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 and like i slept <laughs> with your wife and all this stuff and like the joke was that it's satirical like they weren't actually being nasty to these people it's like if you go to a, a stand-up show today if people will mock you or you, you laugh at somebody else but the the idea is that's not true but people probably got the wrong end of this didn't they that it's okay to mock socrates and that he is like this um so he here he's responding to these old accusers and the last thing to say just before we move on here is that he's saying oh i'm not actually a teacher i'm not a teacher in the conventional sense anyway uh, so for me to be accused of corrupting the youth again one of these old accusations is is plainly false i don't take money for it i'm not a sophist and, and these are the reasons why you think so. And, and at the face of it, not to give too much further analysis, it seems like a half decent defense, but I'm not allowed to say <laughs> that. We're about to jump into Socrates' main monologue bit, so this will take up the, uh, I guess, the, the, the force of our reading here. One of you might perhaps interrupt me and say, But Socrates, what is your occupation? From where have these slanders come? All these rumors and talk would not have arisen unless you did something other than most people. Tell us what it is that we may not speak inadvisably about you. Anyone who says that seems to be right, and I will try to show you what has caused this reputation and slander. Listen then, perhaps some of you will think I am jesting. What has caused my reputation is none other than a certain kind of wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Human wisdom, perhaps. It may be that I really possess this, or those whom I mentioned just now are wise with a wisdom more than human else I cannot explain it, for I certainly do not possess it. And whoever says I do is lying and speaks to slander me. I'll show him slander. <laughs> Gentlemen, do not create a disturbance, even if you think I am boasting, for the story I shall tell you does not originate with me, but I will refer you to a trustworthy source. I shall call upon the gods as witness to the existence and nature of my wisdom, if it be such. Objection! You can't really tell the gods. the gods. You can't just say objection all the time, guys. Overruled! <laughs> I went to one of those men, reputed as wise, thinking that there, if anywhere, I could refute the oracle and say to it, This man is wiser than I. But you said that I was wiser. Then, when I examined this man, there is no need for me to tell you his name. He was one of our public men. I thought that he appeared wise to many people, and especially to himself. But he was not. I then tried to show him that he thought himself wise, but that he was not. As a result, he came to dislike me, and so did many of the bystanders. So I withdrew and thought to myself, 
I am wiser than this man. It is likely that neither of us knows anything worthwhile, but he thinks he knows something that he does not. Whereas when I do not know, neither do I think I know, so I am likely to be wiser than he to this small extent. Gentlemen of the jury, I must tell you the truth. I experienced something like this. In my investigation in the service of God, I found that those who had the highest reputation were nearly the most deficient, while those who were thought to be inferior were more knowledgeable. After the politicians, I went to the poets, the writers of tragedies and comedies, and all the others. Finally, I went to the craftsmen, for I was conscious of knowing practically nothing, and I knew that I would find that they had knowledge of many fine things. In this, I was not mistaken. They knew things I did not know, and to that extent, they were wiser than I. But gentlemen of the jury, the good craftsmen seem to me to have the same fault as the poets. Each of them, because of his success at their craft, thought himself very wise in other most important pursuits, and this error of theirs overshadow the wisdom they had. Oh, wonderful chills, Ollie! You're a great Socrates. You're a man of uh, many talents, of many crafts, you might say. I know nothing, Jack. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's yeah. briefly unpack some of the ideas here. Um, I guess the key one for me, and do kick me if I'm missing anything, uh, we missed this idea of um, there's this oracle of Delphi, uh, Apollo the god, as is spoken through this oracle to Socrates one day. And Socrates' friend, whose name evades me, asks the oracle, is anybody wiser than Socrates? And the oracle gives him a one-word answer. He just says no. But Socrates in this dialogue is saying, look, I didn't think of myself as wise. Um, so what does this truth mean? He means he's wise because he knows what he does not know. And this is something we spoke about in a further analysis in episode 70 as well. So he's saying here that I guess he's rejecting the claim as well that he's accused, as we've mentioned, just his old accusers and his new accusers both think in the courtroom that he's denying the gods. And he's here actually saying, no, I'm not denying the gods. Look, I've got a privileged role, actually. I'm, I'm more I'm chosen than most of you. I've been given uh, this knowledge through an oracle and that theme will carry through to the end of the dialogue yeah the only thing i want to add on to that is just how i guess how common a mistake it is for people who sort of profess greatness in in one area and then like to chime in on on areas that they are lacking and that's that's simply it that's what makes socrates wise is that he doesn't overstep his boundaries he knows when he's actually lacking and that other people should follow suit um and that really is what i guess a lot of people's take away from socrates in general is so it's quite an important passage let this suffice as a defense against the charges of my earlier accusers after this i shall try to defend myself against Miletus, that good and patriotic man as he says he is Socrates is guilty of corrupting the young and of not believing in the gods in whom the city believes, but in other new spiritual things. Such is our charge. Let us examine it point by point. He says that I am guilty of corrupting the young, but I say that Miletus is guilty of dealing frivolously with serious matters, of irresponsibly bringing people into court, and of professing to be seriously concerned with things about none of which he has ever cared and I shall try to prove that this is so. Come here and tell me, Miletus. Surely you consider it of the greatest importance that I young and be as good as possible? Indeed I do. Come then, tell the jury who improves them. You obviously know, in view of your concern, you say you have discovered the one who corrupts them, namely me, and you bring me here and accuse me to the jury? Come, inform the jury and tell them who it is. I, um, I... You, you see, Miletus, that you are silent, and you know not what to say. Does this not seem shameful to you, and sufficient proof of what I say? That you have not been concerned with any of this? Tell me, good sir, who improves our young men? The laws. That is not why I am asking. But what person who has knowledge of the laws to begin with? These jurymen, Socrates. How do you mean, Miletus? Are these able to educate the young and improve them? Certainly. All of them? Or some, but not others? All of them. Very good. By Hera. You mention a great abundance of benefactors. But what about the audience? Do they improve the young or not? They do, too. What about the members of council? The councillors also. But Miletus, what about the assembly? Do members of the assembly corrupt the young, or do they all improve them? They improve them. 
All the Athenians, it seems, make the young into fine good men except me. You condemn me to a great misfortune. Tell me, does this also apply to horses, do you think? That all men improve them and one individual corrupts them? Or is it quite the contrary true? One individual is able to improve them, or very few, namely the horse breeders. Whereas the majority, if they leave horses and use them, corrupt them. Is that not the case, Miletus? Both with horses and all other animals? Of course it is. And by Zeus, Miletus, tell us also whether it is better for a man to live among good or wicked fellow citizens. Do not the wicked do some harm to those who are ever closest to them, whereas good people benefit them? Certainly. And does the man exist who would rather be harmed than benefited by his associates? Answer, my good sir, for the law orders you to answer. Is there any man who wants to be harmed? Well, of course not, Socrates. Come now, do you accuse me here of corrupting the young and making them worse deliberately or unwillingly? Deliberately. What follows, Miletus? Are you so much wiser at your age than I am at mine that you understand that wicked people always do some harm to their closest neighbours while good people do them good? Do I do such evil deliberately as you say? I do not believe you, Miletus, and I do not think anyone else will. Either I do not corrupt the young, or if I do, it is unwillingly, and you are lying in either case. Tell us, Miletus, how you say that I corrupt the young? Or is it obvious it is by teaching them not to believe in the gods in whom the city believes, but in other new spiritual things? Is this not what you say I teach and so corrupt them? That is most certainly what I do say. Then by those very gods about whom we are talking, Miletus, make this clearer to me and to the jury. I cannot be sure whether you mean that I teach the belief that there are some gods, and therefore I myself believe there are no gods. This is what I mean, that you do not believe in gods at all. You are a strange fellow, Miletus. Why do you say this? Do I not believe, as other men do, that the sun and the moon are gods? No. By Zeus, juryman, for he says that the sun is stone and the moon is earth. My dear Miletus, do you think you are prosecuting Anagaraxis? By Zeus, what do you think of me, Miletus? That I do not believe that there are any gods? That is what I say, that you do not believe in the gods at all. You cannot be believed, Miletus. I think he contradicts himself in the affidavit, as if he said, Socrates is guilty of not believing in the gods, but believing in gods. And surely that is the part of a jester. Examine with me, gentlemen, how he appears to contradict himself. And you, Miletus, answer us. Oh, <laughs> Remember, gentlemen, what I asked you when I began, not to create a disturbance if I proceed in my usual manner. Does any man, Miletus, believe in human activities who does not believe in humans? I think he's uh, sophistry. Gentlemen, make him answer, and not again and again create a disturbance. Does any man who does not believe in horses believe in horsemen's activities? Horsemen's not the same thing. Mm. Or in flute playing activities, but not in the flute players? I've played the flute before. No! <laughs> No, my good sir, no man could. If you are not willing to answer, I will tell you in the jury. Answer the next question. Does any man believe in spiritual activities who does not believe in spirits? No one? Thank you for answering, if reluctantly. Now you say that I believe in spiritual things and teach about them, whether new or old. But if I believe in spiritual things, I must quite inevitably believe in spirits. Is that not so? No, I still don't like his argument. <laughs> It is indeed so. Do we not believe spirits to be either gods or the children of gods, yes or no? Of course. Then since I do not believe in spirits, as you admit, if spirits are gods, this is what I mean when I say you speak in riddles and in jest. As you state that I do not believe in gods, and then again that I do, since I do believe in spirits. I do not think, gentlemen of the jury, that it requires a prolonged defence to prove that I am not guilty of the charges in Miletus' disposition. But this is sufficient. If I am undone, it is not by Miletus, but the slanders and envy of many people. This has destroyed many other good men, and will, I think, continue to do so. There is no danger that it will stop at me. Wonderful end scene. Wonderfully read again. The parody. That's really good. I think that um, j just to be brief, because we've got uh, two or three more scenes before the end of this reading. Uh, here we have Socrates' main defence against the idea that he's. It's unclear. He's denying the city's gods. That's what he's accused of, and that might be considered atheism or even like a form of agnosticism today. But then his defence here is saying. 
kind of linking to our last section of reading is when he said that he had the special mission from Apollo. Now he's saying, actually, I do have, I do believe in some spirits. Because you're saying I create spirits, yet I don't believe in spirits. So which is it? So he's kind of given, well, he has directly given, put the words in Melitz's mouth, like a P and not P, classic law of non-contradiction. He, he's doing it in his usual manner and saying, look, it can't be the case that I do and don't believe this thing. Like, take a silly example. Like, uh, if I made this claim the cup is on the table and the cup is not on the table it's like so which is it like you're making no sense when you make such a statement so he's kind of uh, reduction of asserting their argument by showing there's a contradiction which follows from their premises um, but no it's a re really interesting and um, provocative argument isn't it I don't think they're going to be taking much to it, though. Isn't yeah. The... I mean, personally for me, like, it's really fun to read. But I also feel like Socrates is doing that thing where, like, we get it. He's right. But also he's not really trying to win, like, the jury over. Like, he keeps kind of, like, somewhat insulting them and Miletus and stuff. He's not kind of just going, like... I think there's a kind of a sense with this sense that people would, like, play the game of court, maybe, especially in these times uh, in ancient Athens. Well, I think this is really out of what people would be doing in court. People would play the game, but Socrates is refusing to play it. Bear in mind, in a moment, we're going to hear Socrates say something, I'd like, I'd rather die than give up philosophizing. And this is his, he's standing in front of 500 people. So imagine he stops doing philosophy in front of 500 people. He's not being pious. So he's carrying on doing this despite it's definitely not in his best interests. Uh, so we've got two or three more scenes. So we'll jump into, uh, is there a word for not penultimate, but like penultimate, penultimate? Near the end. <laughs> With the end. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Are you not ashamed, Socrates, to have followed the kind of occupation that has led to your being now in danger of death? This is the truth of the matter, gentlemen of the jury. Whenever a man has taken a position that he believes to be true... Oh, f oh, I got that wrong, I guess. Whenever a man has taken a position that he believes <laughs> to be true... When a man and right. a woman... Here's the truth of the matter. Um... <laughs> Let me just reach for my notes. <laughs> oh, actually, I've got a really important business meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wonder where you for throw away. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever a man has taken a position he sees as best, there he must, I think, remain and face danger, without a thought for death or anything else, rather than disgrace. To fear death, gentlemen, is no other than to think oneself wiser than one is, to think one knows what one does not know. No one knows whether death may not be the greatest of all blessings for a man. Yet men fear it as if they knew it is the greatest of all evils. And surely it is the most blameworthy ignorance to believe that one knows what one does not know. It is perhaps on this point and in this respect, gentlemen, that I differ from the majority of men. I do know, however, that it is wicked and shameful to do wrong and to disobey one's superior, be he God or man. I shall never fear or avoid things of which I do not know, whether they may not be good rather than things that I know to be bad. If you were to say to me, Socrates, we do not believe in eaters now, we acquit you, but only on condition that you spend no more time on this investigation and do not practice philosophy, and if you are caught doing so, you will die. If, as I say, you were to acquit me on these terms, I would say to you, Gentlemen of the jury, I am grateful and I am your friend, but I would obey God rather than you. Oh, God, 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 is he saying you'd rather follow? Has he got a death wish? Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> How Zeus! <laughs> what is this madness? <laughs> Neither Miletus or Anitus can harm me in any way. He could not harm me, for I do not think it is permitted that a better man be harmed by a worse. Certainly he might kill me, or perhaps banish or disenfranchise me, which he and maybe others think to be great harm. But I do not think so. I think he is doing himself much greater harm doing what he is doing now, attempting to have a man executed unjustly. 
Ooh, okay, right. We're going to get into our penultimate scene in just a moment. But the most shocking part of this here, we've got two big things, haven't we? We've got a, essentially a turn into a more metaphysical and lofty argument about perhaps death's not the end. I don't fear it because you are so certain that it's this bad thing. You can't be certain of such absolutes. It might be the case that we carry on. So I don't fear it for these reasons. We'll analyze that later. Don't you worry. <laughs> and, and then he says, like, even if you were to quit me, I'd still keep rallying against the state in this philosophizing they see this philosophizing as a challenge the athenian state the city and he's saying here that no i will carry on doing this this is shocking to the audience that they're there to defend the city after all the turmoil which we'll speak about in further analysis and discussion athens needs to be secure and he's saying no matter what happens i'm going to carry on doing the thing that none of you like uh, this might be the nail in socrates's coffin and finally he says that Miletus nor Anitus cannot harm me, this, this famous quotation. And he's saying, there's this last little point, that Miletus is putting great harm on himself. He's staining his own soul by doing something unjust. And I, Socrates, I'm above that. I am pious. I'm not going to taint my soul by acting unjustly. That's for you to do. That's up to you if you want to do that. I'm not going to play this game. But an ultimate scene! It's so exciting. Where, where are we? I, I, let's find out. I have never been anyone's teacher. If anyone, young or old, desires to listen to me when I am talking and dealing with my own concerns, I have never begrudged this to anyone. But I do not converse when I receive a fee. Why then do some people enjoy spending considerable time in your company? You have heard why, gentlemen of the jury. I have told you the whole truth. They enjoy hearing those being questioned who think they are wise, but are not. And this is not unpleasant. To do this has, as I say, been enjoined upon me by God, by means of oracles and dreams, and in every other way that a divine manifestation has ever ordered a man to do anything. If I corrupt some young men and have corrupted others, then surely some of them have grown older and realized that I gave them bad advice when they were young, and should now themselves come up here to accuse me and avenge themselves. I don't see any of them around yeah. here. See his friends. You will, find, you will find quite the contrary, gentlemen. The audience is full of my friends. These men are all ready to come to the help of the corrupter, the man who has harmed their kindred, as Miletus and Anita say. Now, those who were corrupted might well have reason to help me, but the uncorrupted, their kindred, who are older men, have no reason to help me except the right and proper one that they know that Miletus is lying and that I am telling the truth. Very well, gentlemen of the jury. This and maybe other similar things is what I have to say in my defence. Perhaps one of you might be angry as he recalls that when he himself stood trial on a less dangerous charge, he begged and pleaded and implored the jury with many tears that he brought his children and many of his friends and family into the court to provoke as much pity as he could. But that I do none of these. Even though I may seem to be running an ultimate risk. Thinking of this, he might feel resentful towards me and angry about this, cast his vote in anger. Why do I do none of these things? Not through arrogance, gentlemen, nor through lack of respect for you. Whether I am brave in the face of death is another matter, but with regard to my reputation and yours, and that of the whole city, it does not seem right to me to do these things, especially at my age and with my reputation. I leave it to you and God to judge me in the way that will be best for me and for you. Ooh, end that penultimate scene. That was wonderful. So just a couple of the key themes here before we move forward. Here we have Socrates' defense against the charge that he's corrupting the youth. He said, if I'm corrupting the youth, where are they all? Now I've grown old in my age. If I was corrupting the youth before, they would have grown old now and they would resent me. Even then, if you might think that, okay, they don't resent you. They just don't know what you've done to them. Why aren't their families angry at me as well? None of these things have occurred. Secondly, he's saying something like, everyone else would do this in court. I'm not going to do this because I'm, I'm, I want to treat argument, rationality, reason. That comes first before some kind of plea to emotion. And there, indirectly, he's responding to being a sophist as well. Isn't he? He's not using sophistry. He's just using the argument in yeah. the way that he uses it. So he's trying to show as well, not just through the words he's saying, but the way he's saying them. 
Now, what he's not doing is sophistry, but what he's doing is dialectic, yeah. re- rhetorical argument. And specifically, he mentions his kids, right? So he has three children that he doesn't bring. And he says, you know, a lesser man would bring their children to the courtroom and have them crying and be like, you can't kill me. Well, who's going to look after the kids? A lesser, um, lesser man wouldn't bring them, but would mention them. And say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, I'm not going to bring them because they... <laughs> Because I've corrupted them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a kind of little, kind of interesting touch. Order in the court, order. After much deliberation, the vote has been counted. By 60 votes, we find the defendant guilty of corrupting the youth of Athens of the dying the gods. Order, order. There are many other reasons for my not being angry with you for convicting me gentlemen of the jury and what happened was not unexpected for the guilty i request the penalty of death he assesses the penalty of death so be it what counter assessment should i propose to you gentlemen of the jury clearly it should be a penalty i deserve and what do i deserve to suffer or to pay because i have deliberately not led a quiet life but have neglected what occupies most people wealth Household affairs, the position of general or public orator. What do you deserve for being such a man? Some good, gentlemen of the jury. If I must truly make an assessment according to my deserts and something suitable. The Olympian victor makes you think yourself happy. I make you happy. He does not need food, but I do. I assess free meals in the Magistrates Hall of Athens, the reward given to the victorious Olympian athletes. <laughs> Socrates, <laughs> an athlete. <laughs> meals. <laughs> Olympics. <laughs> when I say this, you may think, as when I spoke of appeals to pity and entreaties, that I speak arrogantly. But that is not the case, gentlemen of the jury. Rather, it is like this. I am convinced that I never willingly wrong anyone, but I am not convinced you do this. You should fear death. What should I fear? That I should suffer the penalty Miletus has assessed against me, of which I say I do not know whether it is good or bad? Am I then to choose in preference to this something I know very well to be an evil and assess the penalty at that? You should fear prison. Imprisonment? Why should I live in prison, always subjected to the ruling magistrates, the eleven, a fine and imprisonment until I pay it? That would be the same thing for me, as I have no money. You should fear exile. Exile? It would be a fine life at my age to be driven out of the city, for I know very well that whenever I go, the young men will listen to my talk as they do here. I am not accustomed to think that I deserve any penalty. If I had money... I would assess the penalty at the amount I could pay, for that would not hurt me. But I have none, unless you are willing to set the penalty at the amount I can pay, and perhaps I could pay you. The court will now vote on whether or not the defendant, the great Socrates, uh, deserves to leave with merely a fine. His friends will pay Another day, he'll remain in prison until then. Now, what do you think about that meal suggestion? (laughs) The second vote has been counted by two-thirds. Socrates, you have been found guilty in your sentence of death by the Athenian judiciary. You have a closing statement before you will be taken off to prison. If you had waited but a little while... Order in the court, order. If you had waited but a little while... This would have happened of its own accord. You see my age, that I am already advanced in years and close to death. It is not difficult to avoid death, gentlemen of the jury. It is much more difficult to avoid wickedness, for it runs faster than death. Slow and elderly as I am, I have been caught by the slower pursuer. Whereas my accusers, being clever and sharp, have been caught by the quicker wickedness. I leave you now, condemned to death by you but they are condemned by truth to wickedness and injustice. If death is like this, I say it is an advantage, for all eternity would then seem to be no more than a single night. If, on the other hand, death is a change from here to another place, and what we are told is true, and all who have died are there, what greater blessing could there be, gentlemen of the jury? Now the hour to part has come. I go to die, you go to live. Which of us goes to the better lot is known to no one except the gods.
You can't handle the truth, Socrates. <laughs> Get him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I demand a retrial because of the man I demand a I... trial by combat <laughs> I mean even if I'm being sentenced to death could I could I still have that food please <laughs> also we're still going to take the money <laughs> <laughs> well we're going to be unpacking analysing giving the themes giving our own views in the next and still in further analysis and discussion so we'll hold on for all of that uh, I really enjoyed your reading of Socrates. Oh, you're a man of many talents. We've got Jean-Paul Baptiste, uh, Charlie from Chan- <laughs> uh, Flowers for Algernon. Who did you read The Metamorphosis? Can you remember? I can't remember. I think it was a combination, wasn't it? Yeah, that was We're a very all, kind of, all like, kind that of was an all over the place, place affair. Hey, yeah. it's Christmas soon. You could pick up a little sideshow gig being Santa Claus. Don't I don't know how that's relevant, but sure. <laughs> it's Christmas. You're a good voice actor. Ho, ho, ho. Merry <laughs> Christmas. Been existentialist Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Suffering is pain. <laughs> You're not here for the true meaning of Christmas, Jimmy. <laughs> the true meaning of Christmas is angst, Jimmy. <laughs> wow, I sure am keen for a game of mystery philosopher, Jack. Is that Socratic irony? Are you actually looking forward to it? Um, no comment. Well, being as you twisted my arm. <laughs> There's the jingle. <laughs> <laughs> The Mystery Philosopher. <laughs> Welcome back to <laughs> Mystery Philosopher. Everyone's second favourite part of the show behind Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. You have to wait till next week for that. Are you ready for your Mystery Philosopher, gentlemen? Who got last time? So it was uh, you, Andy got it last time, I think. Yeah. I oh, don't know. No, no, Mystery no, Philosopher, no, no, I got. No, he won. That, and then I he won, won the, Pop Pop. Uh, yeah. In the last episode. Well, in this week's episode, you have a new quotation, a new person behind the quotation. Feast your earlobes on this philosophical gem. Being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Ooh, okay. Andrew, you think you know that one? I mean, I would go John Locke. It's John Locke. And can you tell me which book it's from for a purposeless... Second Treatise on Government. It's the Second Treatise on Government. (laughs) Well done, Andy. Well done. That was very good. Very good. Well, we'll see you next week for further analysis and discussion. It's all very available on Patreon and it's the Christmas season. I keep mentioning it, but it's the time for giving and giving to us specifically. We'll see you next week for further analysis and discussion. Thank you again for enjoying the show. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)